Welcome to the Donna Sebo Show. Donna is an international mental practitioner, psychic, award-winning author, counselor, speaker, teacher, and radio television talk show personality. She brings to the airwaves talented people from around the world who share their insights and experiences with you, the listening audience. Now, let's join Donna. Hello and welcome to my broadcasting table. Donna Sebo here. We're going to be talking about an essence. Yes, an essence called fear. Fear wears so many different costumes and sneaks in and out of our lives in so, so many different ways that sometimes it will catch us unaware and we will be in its choking grip and we wonder, is life going to ever be balanced? Is life ever going to have any hope? We go through all kinds of nonsensical noise in our heads. Why do I say it? Because I've done this myself. And it's amazing how, if you can stand back just long enough, you can realize that sometimes those fears that you've had or that maybe you're experiencing right now can be the greatest teachers you could ever imagine. But when you're in its grip, it sure doesn't feel that way. And my guest, Revlin Marilyn Redman, Finding Reality Beyond Fear is a topic that she faced head on. And in this book, Finding Reality Beyond Fear, we're going to be sharing some of her stories and her experiences and what she felt she had to learn before she knew how to not make fear a companion that was going to haunt her for the rest of her life. Marilyn, I want to welcome you to the show. I am so glad to be with you, and so thank you that, for asking me. This is a real treat. Well, you know, Marilyn, you're a fellow broadcaster. It tickles me no end to find out that we started off or were engaged in broadcasting 20 years ago, maybe even more, at a station in our local area, KLAY. Well, I really enjoyed it at the time. I would drive over to Lakewood, and I would just really have a nice time while I was there, and had a real good experience. The manager was wonderful to me, very helpful, because that was my first experience on air. I've had a radio show since then, too. But that's when I got introduced to radio, was at KLAY. Mm -hmm. And it's gone now. It's no longer there. Clay Huntington, who was the owner of that particular station for all of its life, when he passed away, it was about four or five years later that the station was sold and taken over. He was the last independent radio station in this area. So we've got a touch of history yes, in our backgrounds. Do. Yes, we do. That level of radio and it just, you know, it's something that we won't see days like that again. And look at what we've been able to enjoy relative to the Internet. It's amazing. Well, my shows on KLAY are on my website. Oh, fabulous. And so if people do want to find out more about those shows that I had way back then, actually they're still relevant today because what I've discovered, the truth doesn't change. That is very, very real. In your very first page, I will actually, it's page nine on your book, there is a couple of sentences that just made me smile. You say, some people call putting your ducks in a row. I did all the right things. At least I thought I did. Somehow my row of ducks fell apart and I was not happy with the results. I read that and I started to laugh. And it wasn't because it was laughing at what your experiences are. But I've always been an odd duck out myself, and so no matter how hard I tried to fit into whatever the protocols were anywhere, it just didn't work. And when I saw you saying the same things, I had to laugh. I said, yep, there's that just is the way life is, isn't it? <laughs> well, I didn't know how well things were set up for me to have to go through learning how to get my ducks in a row. I still don't do it perfectly today, but things do go better. <laughs> Yes, they do. And you you bring out so many points in your book. And as I said when I was introducing you, fear has so many costumes that it changes and shifts into. When did you really realize that 
you had the responsibility to change yourself. I think that's one of the biggest challenge any one of us faces. Well, I was in a real traumatic situation. I was in a domestic violent marriage of abuse and uh, rape, and so I was wanting out of the situation. I had been in that marriage for 30 years at that point, and uh, trying to get out of the marriage, didn't know how. I even tried suicide because I was emotionally three years old at that point. And one night when he was trying to kill me, it was a car situation. He was driving really manic, and he was going to put us all out. And um, we had a new three head-on collision. I mean, it was we just missed being hit, you know, three times head-on, and I just panicked. I'd gone to church for 50 years, but I never prayed from my heart. And I that always from the hymnal. And that night... Without even thinking, I just spontaneously said, God, please help me. I really don't want to die. And and so he was actually moved off the freeway. We were in Canada coming home from Harrison Hot Springs. And we were off the road, so I knew that we were safe from having car accidents. And uh, one thing led to another, long story. It's all described in several of my books. Uh, I ended up in treatment for it's called codependency. I didn't even know the word in those days. And in that particular situation, they taught us a spiritual path. And uh, that's when I learned about meditation, and that's how I learned how effective prayer can be. And that's when I learned that I had to change because codependency means I'm aban- feeling abandoned if the other person leaves, and i got to hang on to them like glue or I'll be abandoned, and that's not a healthy place to be. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn how to love myself and how to release the past so I could move into the now. And I was always living in that fear you talked about. I was always reacting from it, and that kept me a victim and powerless. And I had no hope, and I didn't know a clue. I mean, when I saw my dad beat my mom when I was three years old, I shut down emotionally completely and that's what I grew up without any feelings so I didn't have any idea of what was going on and I was doing my best to make things work for the family I was married and had two children and uh, ended up in 12-step programs and through the steps of the program I learned how to release those past situations and emotions you know the fear the guilt I had lots of guilt lots of shame a lot of, um, you name it, I, I was afraid of everything. I was powerless, and I didn't know how to do it differently, but through learning how to release those negative energies that come from the ego, some people call it edging God out. I didn't know I was edging God out. I was raised in a church my whole life, so I didn't know anything about a conscious contact with God, and the church preached against meditation, and so... I learned what I needed to learn in treatment to get myself on a path that was going to work and get my ducks going in a better way. So it was a matter, it's a transition and a process. And uh, in my book, Paradigm Busters, I give the great details of how I actually moved out of the fear, false emotions appearing real, because what I discovered is fear is not real. And if I walk in faith, I can't have fear. I can't have fear and faith at the same time. So I started with a little smidgen of faith, and gradually I learned how to let my faith grow. I'd say, okay, God, here we go again. I need more faith for this one. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'd have to move forward with something that scared the dickens out of me. But I had to grow into being a loving person and out of the fear and into what was real instead of the fear was running my life. And today... I don't have fear running my life. Mm-hmm. One of the points that you bring out, and this is right in the very first chapter, and I thought it was a significant one, and that is that the man you had married, you had met in college, and you said you both were like two little scared children. And I thought that that was such a powerful statement because when we are in that modality of fear, fear of abandonment, or we get caught up with cultural norms, you know, you're a bad girl if you do this or do that, and you're a bad boy if you do this or you do that, and finding 
oneself usually takes quite a bit of willingness to say, what is my positioning in this? And that was something that I found so powerful in your book, is that in the process of becoming aware of yourself, that you said, and your faith, and it was as if you said, okay, I'm going to stop passing the buck, no blame game here, what role did I play? And you began to investigate different things. Now, one of the emphasis that I want to give here is that when you're telling your story, this isn't something where you got some magic bullet. It isn't that way at all. You had to go through the process to be able to recognize who you were. This wasn't something that happened in 30 seconds. And I think that's where people get so fearful and so discouraged. They think that there's never going to be a way out of their whatever it is they're going through. And that can be as varied as the leaves on a tree. So you have all of these experiences, and you went through many years of this, many years of abuse and questioning. And what was it that made you, was there a a particular incident? Was it that car accident that made you say, enough is enough? I've got to move on? Yeah, the car incident was definitely one. Well, he tried to kill me several times. I tried suicide several times, but it was like that was enough, was enough. I was tired of being sick and sick and tired. And so in, in making that decision, actually the prayer was answered and all kinds of doors were opened to help me find the right opportunity so I could move out of it. And that's great. Now, Many women, and men have this fear too, but especially with women, and I think often it's passed along genetically, financial insecurity. And you said you had to stop being dishonest with yourself and that you had a chance to really understand what trust is all about too. And boy, that was something, and it's an issue For so many of us, the issue of trust, men and women both. It was huge for me. Um, When you're getting hurt as a child, you know, I, I couldn't trust my parents. They weren't trustworthy. So... You know, when my stepdad was beating me, and, and I'd say, what did I do wrong? You know, and he says, I'm only doing this because I love you. He was beating me with a two-by-four. And I learned that love hurts. And so how do you trust your parents that are hurting you, and how do you trust something invisible called God? So trust for me was totally, totally difficult. I came to the understanding, and this is true, when the days of black and white television All State Insurance had a commercial where the man is standing on the cliff and hands come up to the cliff, which, of course, is the hands of an insurance company. And he used to walk into the hands of All State Insurance. Well, I visualized the hands of God coming up to the cliff, and I walked into the hands of God, and God's hands wouldn't let me down. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's how I started to have trust. And... Uh, it, it's a practice thing that when God literally, and other than that car ride, there was a night when we were supposedly in recovery, and he was going to kill me that night, too. I would have been another Nicole Simpson. And angels actually came in and stopped him. I've written that in several articles. And, and uh, I literally saw God work in my life, and I'd never known about that uh, invisible power there. That's not what my church taught. And and so I literally saw angels surround him so he couldn't come any closer. And angels escorted me out the door. I was absolutely traumatized at that point because I was cornered in a tiny little bedroom with no options. And I was told by the silent voice inside to pray, God, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. God, forgive him, for he knows not what he does. And the voice said, now you can leave. And he never touched me again. I walked out the door, turned around to see if he was following me, and the look on his face, I wish I'd had a camera. It was just really uh, <laughs> not the look I ever saw before. For sure he was really bewildered. And I went one, to one end of the house, he went to the other end. And I found the answer 
to domestic violence is when you pray for somebody, that's the armor of God. Nobody can attack love. And so your protection is to send love. It's not to, when you defend yourself, you're actually attacking the other person. That's what it feels like to them. And I didn't learn that. It took 18 years of recovery to realize and actually feel the feelings that I was actually uh, sending out projections of my defensiveness, trying to protect myself, and he saw it as an attack. And, of course, in our regular lifetime, people see the man coming back, but he's actually trying to defend himself. But it's a subconscious attack, and he comes back physically. So when you send out love is your greatest protection. And when that happened in front of my eyes, I had trust. I trust, I've trust. i trusted God like you wouldn't believe ever since then. He kept me alive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There are so many different sides of what your experiences were like. And you said today you live one day at a time, and you don't get caught up with your past. You say, I don't uh, have the dread and worries about what's going to happen tomorrow. Get on, I get on with my life right here, right now. Now, the buzzword in today's environment is mindfulness. Mindfulness about where you are, what's going on, giving full attention to the present moment, and not going back and wallowing in the past. But I sincerely think that when we take the occasion to stop and look back at what has evolved, many times we find those circumstances had many different teachers that were willing to help us and give us whatever it was. It could be a stranger on a corner. It can be a member of family. It can be just about anybody. And it's as if the universe is knocking on your door saying, are you attentive? Are you paying attention to what's going on? It's really fascinating, isn't it? Well, what I discovered is instead of reacting to the fear, I now respond in love to whatever the circumstances are and try to find a loving resolution. And because life is about cause and effect. And so if you're coming from fear like I did for all those many, like 45 years, uh, things were a disaster. The results came from the fear. Fear is like a magnet, and it draws more to you. And if you're sending out love, love comes back to you. So it's what goes around comes around, and I've learned to send out and I don't have always the best of situations going on, but if I send love to it, it seems like the situations work themselves out. You also address in your book, Finding Reality Beyond Fear. You address in one of your chapters, Finding Health and Sanity, and you deal with alcoholism and drug addiction. And you say there are hereditary, genetic and generational predispositions to becoming an alcoholic and also for drug addiction. This is something that more and more research is being done uh, relative to this. And this had a huge impact on your ex-husband. He's passed away now. But this was something, those demons really worked him over big time and when the situation came where the two of you, after 30 years, went your separate ways, it was a wake-up time for him, too, wasn't it? Well, to a degree it was. We were married for 30 years. I filed, took three times to actually get the divorce, or I had enough guts to follow through with it. So our we were divorced 35 years after we were married for 35 years, technically. And during the five years, there wasn't any addiction active going on, drinking or prescriptions from the doctors. Now, the combination and treatment I found taught is one pill and one drink is six times the effect. Doctors don't tell you that when they give you the medications. But I found out when I was in a state without all that medication, I said to God, I need to know what's going on so I don't have to repeat this. I don't want to repeat another battering and abusive life of rape. And God said, you have to become the person you you want in your relationship so that you attract that. And so I worked, started working really hard on, uh, you know, I, want, I made a list, spirituality, honesty, sincerity, uh, faith, faithful, trustworthy, you know. So those are the things I tried to become so that I would attract that in my life so I wouldn't repeat it. And at this point, I've been in a 25-year relationship of unconditional love. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I think you bring out a very, very good point. We have to start with ourselves, don't we? Well, I would have never known it if it hadn't come through saying to God, what do I have to do? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have to, what I've really discovered is that voice inside is the truth for you, not maybe somebody else, because if we look to outside authority and experts, and that's what we're trained to do in religion, government, and medicine, and education, is to look outside, we're really supposed to look within our hearts for our own answers, and that silent voice will bring it to us, so, so it can come to different people in different ways, some people have dreams, some, I don't, I, well, I have some dreams I interpret, but generally the silent voice is very active inside of me, telling me and directing me every morning I do my prayer and meditation. And it, I'm, I'm also a medium, and so it guides me in my writing. Uh, all my writing actually comes from Archangel Michael. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's a very valuable tool to get out of your ego and into your heart where the truth is, and then life smooths out considerably. <laughs> You also addressed the violence. Now, in the beginning, when we started our conversation, you were sharing how domestic violence was very much a part of your life. And sadly, there are too many incidences of domestic violence, and much of it is stimulated by drugs or alcohol. Uh, Sometimes people get into such a rage because they have an effect where there's no boundaries and they have really no true thinking processes. It's very dysfunctional. And you go into depth on this and you say that these are things that really you have to look at the core issues. Well, I've discovered even more recently since I wrote that book that All our traits actually come from the very beginning of our essence and before we ever got to Earth. And all the generations pass on what they have to their younger children, and the children pass it on to their children. And it's like in the Bible when it says generation to generation to generation. And we've been, so I do past life regressions, and I know that I was with my husband in at least three other lifetimes of domestic violence, and this was the lifetime to resolve it. And I know that my family history had domestic violence. It wasn't just my parents. And I know that he came from a similar kind of background. That's one reason we connected is like attracts like, and those are the lessons I had to learn how to do better and overcome and go, of course, hopefully proceed beyond it. And to me, going beyond it is called maturity. I don't keep reacting like I just get Excuse me, a scared little child. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's those triggers, mm-hmm. those triggers, and being mindful enough to say, this is triggering me. What is it that it's triggering? Well, one of the things I'm finding out, the more I have love, self-love and self-esteem, they don't trigger me like they used to because I don't fall into the trap. I don't play the, the, the passive-aggressive game like I used to. I am okay inside no matter what they're doing today. I've had to learn that very difficult situation. Being a, My fellow is very, very spiritual, but he has one member of his family that isn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Christmas times are not always the best because they go to a... Uh, they're involved with a religion that's very fear-based. And so being around them is rather difficult. And, uh, of course, holidays, your family wants to get together. And at first it was really, really uncomfortable because I was on this path of learning to love myself, and that's not where they were coming from. In fact, I got into a big argument one Christmas about that. And so uh, I just learned to keep my mouth shut. But as I started to gain in self-esteem, I could let them have their life, and I could have mine, and it didn't have to interfere. There's a slogan, live and let live. So I let them have their experience, and I have mine, but I don't have to want to be part of it. Mm-hmm. True. You mention a Russian biophysicist and a molecular biologist, uh, Gajavzi, uh-huh. uh, that you said proved scientifically that affirmations along with meditation and hypnosis, which is another term for meditation, right. people can shift and make changes. And this is a do-it-yourself job. Well, definitely we can change our consciousness from a fear-based life to a love-based life. And I do it 
when I release the fears in my meditations and ask God to replace them with loving grace so that what moves out is there's no void. I put in what I want. That's what I was told in meditation to do. Replace it with what you do want. And when you do that, you raise your consciousness inside to a higher vibration. You move it into a higher consciousness, and that's what your new consciousness and inner essence becomes. And that's the new things you will attract. So the more you read these, and in Paradigm Busters, I have great charts in there of how to do that how to release all the negativity in the history that your past whatever difficulties, give it to God and replace it with love and grace. And you actually, the first time I felt grace head to toe, I was meditating at the great, um, down in Death Valley, beautiful place to meditate. And I felt grace for the first time in my life, and I thought, I want more of this. So for me, to release the negativity is actually a treat, because then I get into a better place from it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is, there are a couple of statements that I thought were very, very special in your book, Finding Reality Beyond Fear. One was become aware that you're allowing others to take away your power when you focus on them. And then also, we're, uh, we are only as sick as our secrets. And that's important. And your mother carried a secret all of her life. When did you learn about that secret? And when you found out about it, how did it help you? Because she was, uh, she was in a very difficult space for most of her life. Oh, very, yes. Well, when I was um, about five years old, I'd gone through incest at that point, and I went to her trying to talk about what was going on, and she said to me, don't feel that way, and walked away, and I never could ever talk to her about it, and it took me years and years and years, and I have a half-sister, and we, I knew my mom had gone through uh, sexual abuse growing up, and I knew that there had been some pretty harrowing things going on in her growing up because her mother was single during the Great Depression trying to raise eight kids. And, and so I was always wondering what happened to mom, you know, what was going on. And the two of us got together for lunch one day, and we knew of a situation that had gone in that was abusive, and she was left home alone with her a couple other sisters, and that's when apparently she was the one that was abused. We knew one of them was. We weren't sure which. And we, When you know the symptoms of how a person handles their life because of abuse, we were able to narrow it down that it was mom the one, was the one that was actually the one that was uh, accosted. And so that, with her mental illness, uh, was a combination that she passed on to me. I had to heal. I've been actually declared sane uh, from my mental illness, and I have healed uh, eight addictions, and, and uh, I'll, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work on myself. I'm no longer bipolar, and I no longer have the same medical problems I used to, because when you move, like what that scientist said, when you move your vibrations into higher consciousness, you can actually move into that unconditional love of perfection that God created you in, and you're not going to be sick. Mm-hmm. You talk about Mr. Emoto, the one, the gentleman, the scientist that was pho photographing water and the molecules and snowflakes, and his knowledge has been shared around the world over and over and over again. He left such a legacy, which is just a beautiful one, about the power of words and emotions. And you say, when you, I'll use the word, vibrations rise, perceptions change. And this is something you have experienced in many ways in a very joyful way. And one of the statements that you make is changing your behavior and thinking results in different outcomes as you combine forces with the laws of nature. The laws of nature. And this is something that in my experience with people and with myself you really have to get to the core issues. You really have to be able to face those boogeymen of what you've been taught to believe are going to destroy your life. Well, that's why I became a past life regressionist. Um, I'm an ordained minister for spiritual counseling, and that's my focus is to get to the root cause of the, what, when the person comes for help. Where did it start? When you shed light on it, the darkness leaves, and that's when the perception can move you into that consciousness of everything is love. 
that's all there is. And the darkness just actually the, is not a problem anymore because the light obliterates the dark, and it's like you're free. Mm-hmm. Meditation, as you've mentioned, is very important for you. And in our culture, my goodness, 20 years ago, it would just hardly anybody even wanted to mention the word because it was considered woo-woo. Well, today we have football teams, we have all kinds of sports figures that are doing visualization, meditation, and they're finding that it really empowers their lives. The East is meeting West, and it has been actually since the 50s, but there is so much that has finally been acknowledged even by the scientific community. And I think that we're so fortunate in today's world because of that. And you have all kinds of YouTube videos. You have your programs that are up and available for people. And this is something you delight in your work and your book, Finding Reality Beyond Fear. Now, you've written a number of other books, but this is the one we are talking about this evening. People can find out about your books on Amazon, of course, but they can also go to your website to find out about the work that you do, and the website is angelicasgifts.com. That's A-N-G-E-L-I-C-A-S, gifts, plural, dot Com. What all uh, would you recommend that people check out when they come to your website, Marilyn? Well, that's a good question. Along the side, I have a whole listing of the various topics and, and situations. Uh, some uh, go to, I also am a retired teacher, and I know what the problems are in education, so that's a topic that people could check into. I have articles. That I've, I've written hundreds of articles. I'm a columnist uh, for several newspapers. And they're all on there. I uh, also have a blog which has a lot of articles and things on there. Um, so that there's a variety of things of the counseling. I do readings. I do tarot readings. I do all kinds of um, helping people with holistic health and complementary medicine, regression, as we've talked about, past life therapy, relationships. I love to help people with relationship problems and domestic violence addictions. And spiritually talking to those passed over. I'm a medium and I can connect with the higher realms. I talk with my archangels all the time. And so it, I also am an artist of angels. Since I see angels, they've kept me alive 13 times at this point. And I do people's portraits. And I have a section of art on my website. Some of them are portraits and some of them are angels or flowers, pets. I love to do pet portraits and uh, by commission and uh, so there's a big variety of things on my website well reverend marilyn redmond it's been a delight having you as a guest and i wish you continued success in your work and i want to thank you for being with me this evening i want to thank you for asking me this is such an honor and i was so pleased that you did this uh, had me on your show it's just i want to thank you very much oh it's my pleasure again your website is angelica's gifts Dot com And thank you again. We're saying goodbye to Reverend Marilyn Redmond, and that's R-E-D-M-O-N-D, and again, angelicasgifts.com.